Okay, uh, good afternoon. So um, let's get started then. So we're going to cover uh, uh, this linear response theory today. So we talked about uh, the general structure of linear response theory for an arbitrary quantum system and derived the famous Kubo formula. Uh, and now we're going to apply it and get lots of interesting results. Uh, before for the eventually for the interacting electron gas but before we do that we're going to just uh, review the response properties of the free electron gas which also turn out to be quite quite subtle and interesting uh, for for reasons having to do with the existence of the fermi surface okay any questions or comments in general Okay, um, so the picture is we start out with uh, free electrons with this kinetic energy and you up, uh, couple in some external potential, phi x, uh, and then you compute. The, the external potential can be a function of space and time. So after Fourier transform, it's a function of frequency and momentum. Uh, and so that you get a response in linear order at the same frequency and momentum as the external perturbation. So the external perturbation had uh, Fourier components at k and omega, then the response will also be exactly the same for k and omega. Uh, and the coefficient here uh, is we call chi zero. The zero to respond uh, to remind us that it's the free electrons. Uh, I've also put this R, but I'm going to drop that soon enough. Uh, that will be useful later when we consider more general sorts of response functions. But, but just ignore that R for now. Okay, so the Kubo has told us exactly how to compute this kind of art. Uh, and when we compute it, uh, we get the famous uh, Lindhardt response functions. So this is some function of Q and omega, which involves an integral uh, of all momenta K. Uh, and it depends only on the dispersion of the electrons, which I've written here as EK. So, you know, in fact, this integral can be evaluated mostly exactly at zero temperature uh, and it's very complicated looking formulas uh, that you can find in many textbooks. And I'm just going to emphasize some interesting limiting features of this function. So what were some of the interesting properties? So the first property uh, is that if you send the frequency, uh, keep the frequency finite, uh, but send k to zero. So that means that you have a time dependent response which is uniform in space. And because the total number of particles is conserved and something that's uniform in space only couples to the total number of particles, uh, nothing really happens. So the response is zero. On the other hand, the more physical response is the opposite order of limits where you take a static response so that omega is zero, uh, but the wave vector is not zero. It could be very long, but it's not exactly zero. So this corresponds to imposing some uh, slowly varying but static potential. And now what will happen is that electrons will flow from the high potential region to the low potential region. So there'll be some decrease in density here and increase in density there. Uh, and that is precisely a measure of what's called the compressibility because locally in this region, the phi just looks like a chemical potential. So the compressibility is given by this limit uh, of k of chi. Uh, this is actually a very general result for any, any interacting system. Um, and for the free electron gas, uh, if you compute this limit, uh, we get an answer, which is just the density of states at zero temperature. So, so this system is compressible. It's a compressible quantum liquid. Uh, that is, you just change the chemical potential a little bit and the density change, changes. Um, this is in contrast to what are called mod insulators, which are not compressible, that like to be at very specific densities. Or even the fractional quantum Hall state, uh, that's not compressible because it has to be at one third filling or whatever preferred filling you want. The Fermi liquid or the free electron gas can exist at any density as long as the temperature is low enough. Okay, so that's what uh, we've already done. Uh, so now let's look at some other cases. Uh, we'll continue with a static response at omega equals zero, but keep k 
arbitrary. Okay. Um, and then uh, you can still do the integral exactly at zero temperature. And now you really have to do it carefully. There's no, no alternative to just biting the bullet and doing the integral. Uh, so first you can use some simplifications. Uh, so when you go to this expression here, uh, the Lindhardt formula, uh, it's easy to see when omega is zero that these two terms make the same contribution. Uh, and the way you see that is simply by uh, relabeling momenta. So in this, you call this moment a K plus Q as Q. Um, and then uh, there'll be corresponding changes in these momenta. And then you use the fact that K and minus K are the same because of uh, um, uh, spatial inversion symmetry. Uh, and then you can easily see that the contribution of this term is the same as that contribution of this term. So you just take the first term, put omega equals zero, uh, and you put a factor of two. You put another factor of two for spin. Uh, and so then you get this expression with a factor of four out front for two for spin and two for the other term. And it's the Fermi function of psi q over eq minus ek plus q. Okay, this is for any k. Okay, and now the Fermi function becomes very simple at zero temperature. It's just an integral inside the Fermi sphere with an up, upper limit of kf. And then you can expand this. And uh, I guess I have forgotten a factor of m here. So I should probably put that in. Uh, I'm sorry, starting uh, later this lecture, all, I'll have rewritten these notes with all the factors in there. I'm not, today I'm using some old notes and um, yeah, I think there's a factor of 2m that you have to put out front uh, because the dispersion is k squared over 2m. Okay. Um, and similarly over here. Okay, so now you have the integral over all three momenta and you go to spherical coordinates and the usual trick in spherical coordinates is you call cos theta equals mu and you have an integral over mu from minus one to one. You integrate over phi, that gives you a factor of four pi uh, and then you have an integral of q squared dq. Okay, you just do the integral and first thing you're guaranteed uh, is that as k goes to zero, you should just get the density of states. So you pull out a factor of the density of the states. Uh, and the rest only depends on the two length scales that you have, uh, two momentum scales. One is the external momentum k, uh, which is this, and the other is kf. So the result only depends on k over kf. Uh, and it's conventional in all the books, right? It's k over two kf. Uh, of course, the factor of two is just for convenience. Uh, and this function f is, here it is. This is what the function is. It's some function of x that you can evaluate by just doing this integral. Uh, and so what are some of its properties? So one property is that as x goes to zero, it goes to one. Uh, that's uh, that's something that, uh, <clears throat> that must happen because that, that's the density of states response at, uh, to a very long wave and perturbation. And, and you can check that this function goes to one uh, as x goes to zero. So, you know, there seems to be a divergence here, one over four x, but there's the logs also vanish as x goes to one. And so you just expand that out. Okay, put this in Mathematica and you can study all of its properties. So it goes to one smoothly. Uh, it goes to, uh, it go, falls off as one over x squared at large x. Uh, and most interesting, which will be very useful to us later, uh, is that there's a singularity. It's not smooth uh, at x equals one, which is the same as k equals two kf. So something singular is happening at two kf. Uh, there's no discontinuity, uh, but if you look at this function, it's got an infinite derivative there. It's, um, you know, it's not, it's not analytic at that point. And what is this two kf? Well, two kf is what's called the extremal wave vector. Uh, and, you know, one way to understand this is you're looking at, you know, how the Fermi sphere is responding to some, uh, some uh, uh, external potential, which now has an arbitrary wavelength. So that external potential, since it oscillates, it, it has the ability to give momenta to the particles. So it can, what it can do is excite 
uh, a particle that was over here or not, and move it to a particle there, giving it some momentum this distance. Uh, and so now you notice there's something very special about 2KF. Uh, it's the largest momentum at which you can have a zero energy excitation. So beyond 2KF, if you try to make a zero energy excitation, uh, you can't do it. But less than 2KF, you can do it. You can do it at 2KF. Uh, you can do it smaller than 2KF by taking uh, uh, you know, a particle from here to there. That has a wave vector smaller than 2KF. Uh, or any small k, you can have excitations at zero energy uh, up to 2kf. But once you get to 2kf, whatever your energy will be, uh, it'll cost you some energy because you, you probably have, you could have to take a particle from inside the Fermi, say, just inside the Fermi surface to something that's well outside the Fermi surface. And that's going to cost you energy. And that's what leads to this very weak singularity, which you would think you have no concern to us uh, at 2kf but it does have measurable effects. Yeah. And it's quite important uh, as we'll see perhaps even today or if not tomorrow, uh, next lecture on Monday. All right, so that's the summary of the static response. Um, at zero momentum, it just gives you the compressibility of the density of states. Uh, and at finite momentum, there's some weak singularity at the extremal wave vector to KF wave vector. Actually, some of you might be working in STM labs. This, this, two, this two K of singularity is what leads to uh, all the things that are observed in STM experiments these days. Uh, when you have Fermi surfaces, and these uh, oscillations. We'll talk about that soon enough. All right. So that's it for uh, <clears throat> the static response. So now let's look at the dynamic response. So that's case four. So we're going to take the uh, we're going to take the imaginary part now. So we can imagine some time-dependent perturbation, uh, which could have arbitrary momentum also, uh, and you know, signing some light at some frequency or some microwaves, uh, and that's going to uh, excite the system, and the system, in fact, will absorb the energy, um, and that the energy that's absorbed by the system from the incoming light. Uh, is measured by this imaginary part of chi of q and omega. And why this is energy absorption, uh, you know, will uh, become clear in another lecture or two. Um, but you can kind of almost see it from the whole discussion. Uh, this is the case where this denominator, so, the, so when would the imaginary part be non-zero? Well, for the imaginary part to be non-zero, uh, if you look at the Lindhardt function, the only way this eta can make any effect at all, uh, because it's infinitesimal, is if this is zero. So this is zero when you have a kind of a resonance. You have a resonance between, an, you send an energy omega, and you take a particle and put it into a hole uh, with a different momentum q. And when the energy that you're sending in exactly matches the energy required by the particle hole excitation, um, then you have a resonance. So that's the absorption frequency. It's exactly the same, you know, the optical lines in an atom, which you start your study of quantum mechanics with, uh, light comes in and then uh, then there's a uh, there's the Lyman alpha line when you go from say one S to two P states, uh, and that's the resonance where the energy difference equals the frequency of the light. Okay, so then that's when light is absorbed by the atom and it's here it's, here, it's not a sharp line, it's a whole continuum, as we'll see in a minute. Okay, so you take the imaginary part of chi zero, uh, take the imaginary part of the uh, of the denominator that gives you a delta function uh, with a minus pi. And now the beauty here is that this response is not infinite, even in the absence of any explicit source of, of dissipation uh, because of this integral or the continuum of k. So when you, because you have a whole continuum of excitations, you can integrate it and get a finite answer. Okay, so now the next few minutes is just a matter of evaluating this integral with a delta function out front, and we'll only do it at zero temperature. Okay. So you can play with this uh, and show from this representation 
uh, that this is an odd function of omega. Uh, so the imaginary part of chi zero of Q and minus omega is minus the imaginary part chi zero Q and omega. Um, and this is just a property of this representation, and it's also a property of the Kubo formula in general. Um, <clears throat> and it's be very useful when we do something called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, and also probably next week or a little bit later. Uh, so we'll also be saying a bit more about that. Uh, but anyway, so now let's just compute this thing in the simplest case we have going. Uh, so the frequency is uh, greater than zero. Let's assume it's greater than zero without any loss of generality. Uh, and so this, so for, so for this delta function to be satisfied, uh, we must have ek plus q, ek plus omega must be greater than ek. So ek plus q is always greater than ek. Uh, so now you look at this thing. So if you look at the Fermi functions, uh, you want one of them to be one and the other one to be zero. Otherwise the whole thing is zero. So now we know that ek plus q is greater than ek. So there's a possibility where this is zero, where it's a very large energy where the frame of function is zero, whereas q and omega are such that this thing uh, is inside the Fermi function, Fermi sphere. So you get a one here and a zero here. Uh, and quick little thought showing you that's the only possibility. You could not get make this one one and that one zero. Uh, because that would lead to trouble with this inequality that ek plus q is greater than ek. So basically, this factor just disappears, uh, and you only keep this one here. Okay. So now at t equals zero. So now you have uh, uh, only the delta function left over. So this is the integral you have to evaluate uh, d3k over 8 pi cubed. Uh, and I'm sorry, in the k's and q's of interchange notation between the real and imaginary parts. Another something, another issue that will not be an issue with the notes uh, going forward. <laughs> anyway, so just have to evaluate this integral uh, with the constraint that ek is less than zero and ek plus q is greater than zero. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right. So you can find expressions for that integral in many books, it's kind of messy expressions. Uh, <clears throat> it's really an elementary integral. This is all you have to do. Um, but it's surprisingly subtle. Um, excuse me. Let me mute myself. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so evaluation of this integral is surprisingly subtle, uh, but it's not, you know, anything fancy. You just have to go in and put in all the cosine thetas and satisfy all the inequalities and see what you get. Okay, so you just have to play with these inequalities. So, uh, you know, you have to do this integral d3k subject to some constraints. The constraints are, these are the three constraints. ek plus q is ek plus omega ek is less than zero and ek plus q is greater than zero. So what you have to, so the first thing you have to figure out, is there any solution to these three equations uh, for a given value of omega and q? So this is what you're, uh, you know, to find the domain of integration, I give you omega and q, uh, you use omega and q and find suitable values of k that satisfy all three equations. Okay, you just play around with that and quickly you'll find that sometimes for some omega and q, there are no solutions. So if there's no solution, there's, uh, this is just zero. So you have to, so let's just ask, what is the domain over which there are solutions to these three constraints? Uh, okay, you just play around with this uh, and you find that domain is given by this expression here. So this is just, again, a lot of, you know, simple algebra, but I'll just state the result. Where Vf here, this is for a spherical Fermi surface, not for an arbitrary surface. If I give you some arbitrary band structure with arbitrary E of K, <coughs> then solving these equations is quite a mess. 
uh, you probably have to use a computer. Okay, so this is KF over M. I think I'll take a break and get a glass of water. Excuse me. All right, so as I said, you have to find uh, solutions of these three equations, and you find this is the domain of integration. Uh, this is the region in omega and Q space where the domain of integration of K is non-zero. So you get some finite answer. <clears throat> so these are the equations, and here's a graphical plot. So basically, it's in this shaded region over here. where it's possible to find solutions of these equations. Um, <clears throat> so find a vector k for which you can solve these equations. OK, so this, there's this whole region. So this basically this tells us that as long as you send in light or microwave or whatever external uh, perturbation you're sending in, as long as this omega and q is in this region somewhere here, Light will be absorbed. So this is the you know the analog of the spectral lines uh, of an atom. In an atom, you don't worry about Q. The Q is practically zero, and you send in light with some frequency, and you have sharp spectral lines. <coughs> um, in uh, in an electron gas, there's no sharp spectral lines. There are continuum, as you call the particle hole continuum, uh, and so this tells you that this Q. If this is the wavelength of your light, uh, then you can absorb energy up to some frequency uh, and then no more. Beyond that, you can't absorb any energy. Uh, so, I mean, maybe it's easy to try to see that graphically. Why, why would that be the case? Why is that you can't absorb energy after a certain point? Uh, that page, okay. All right. Um, so if here's your Fermi sphere, Um, and and you send in a uh, light with a certain wavelength. So I give you some wavelength. So here's my wave vector Q. Uh, this is my Q, okay, pointing in that direction. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's pick that direction. So now I, I want to absorb, send it in and absorb very little energy. Well, how do I do that? If you want to absorb very little energy, you put the Q over here. So it's going from the Fermi surface to the Fermi surface. Uh, you're creating a hole here and an electron there and absorbing very little energy. And you can do that over there or over here. Uh, and that's about it. Essentially zero energy absorption. Now I want to absorb a little more energy. Well, if you want to absorb a little more energy, uh, then you, uh, let's see, then you, you don't go that, you, you go um, somewhere here, or, you know, so, some, some other region from here to there. If you go here, well, you're good, uh, you know, how much energy you're going to absorb? Well, that's the difference between uh, this distance to the Fermi surface and this distance to the Fermi surface. Okay, uh, in fact, this case you need energy because well, maybe let me draw that better. Uh, uh, so, well, let me draw it from here, here to there. So you notice the energy required is the radial distance from the Fermi surface. So the energy required will be the diff difference between this and this, which is not uh, and this, sorry, which is not exactly zero. It's some small value. Okay, so that's our continuum. So this is this this particular absorption here uh, is this point, and and this absorption here is say that point, and then I keep going. Now, what's the best way to absorb the maximum amount of energy? Well, the best way to absorb the maximum amount of energy uh, is to take a part is to take a particle right here, where this thing, the normal to the Fermi surface. So we go here. And now, uh, sorry. 
this red line is supposed to be parallel to that other line. Okay. So you go some, uh, somewhere like this, where these two lines are parallel. Uh, and, and then this is the maximum energy that you can absorb because you're going radially uh, from the center. And that's it, you can't do any better. You can't absorb energy higher than that for that Q. So that's how you get uh, this line over here. Uh, and then there's also at very large Q, there's also a lower bound for absorbing energy. Uh, so if your Q is really huge, uh, then you have to pay some energy. As we already saw that over here, when we were discussing when Q was bigger than 2KF, you couldn't possibly absorb zero energy. And, and that's, that, so this point here is the 2KF point exactly. And beyond the 2KF point, there is no energy absorption at zero. At zero. Uh, there's no absorption at zero energy. Yeah. All right, so this is the basic physics of the electron gas. Uh, it's got, uh, you know, complicated phase space restrictions on Q and omega uh, with which you can absorb energy. And none of these excitations are what we'd call, you know, sharp excitation. They're broad, uh, they're part of a continuum uh, because there are energies arbitrary nearby, states arbitrary nearby with almost the same energy. Uh, and so, they, so if you created a, an actual lump here, it won't travel like a sharp particle, it'll just dissipate away. So there's no bound state of the particle at all. Now, when you put in Coulomb interactions, and we'll talk about that soon enough, you can create bound states. Uh, and these have various uh, names of, uh, called excitons or plasmons, and, and we're gonna talk about some of that. Uh, and those are coherent excitations, which are sharp absorption lines, uh, but, in a free electron gas, there is no coherent excitation in the particle hole sector anyway. There is a coherent excitation in the single particle sector when you do a photo emission experiment, where you're just ejecting a particle. But when you're creating a particle hole pair, uh, there is no sharp excitation. Okay, so that's a really key property of the free electron gas, uh, these complicated phase space restrictions. Now, there is one limit. Uh, where you can evaluate this integral exactly. Uh, and this I will leave as a homework problem, which, which is way down here. So in this region here, uh, you can evaluate this, uh, uh, this integral with no trouble really. You just take, make the small k approximation, uh, write this as, uh, you know, ek plus k dot q cos theta and do that integral. Uh, and when you do that integral, uh, what you find uh, is that this response function is equal to the density of states times omega over QVF. Uh, so it's linear at omega, it's small omega, uh, but the slope is proportional to one over Q uh, and it's zero for mod omega greater than QVF. So, so, so there's a boundary omega equals QVF uh, above which there's no absorption of energy. And that's this line here. So this line over here, uh, that's exactly the line omega equals Q VF. So there's absorption below it. So here in this region, uh, M chi uh, goes like omega over Q. So it's a, if you plot this, it's kind of a strange looking function uh, as a function of omega anyway, for fixed Q, uh, it just goes straight up and then stops. And this point is QVF. Uh, and this behavior of this, this linear behavior here is the actual result starting from here and going up to that point. Okay. Uh, and there's complicated, uh, um, okay. So there, there's actually, it's not strictly speaking a discontinuity, but this is only valid as Q is very small. Uh, there's a small window here of order Q where things Q over KF where things look a little different. Uh, and all of those details and how these thresholds behave and what happens here, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, that complicated about them in principle. It's just a matter of doing this integral carefully. Uh, and you could spend a fun afternoon or maybe a few days just doing this integral. But it's all worked out in, in a book, in many books. I've just uh, sketch the structure of the answer. 
because all of this will actually be really crucial in thinking about the properties of the interacting electron gas and and you know solids this is this type of stuff is seen on a daily basis but with some modification right now we're just talking about the free electron gas yeah the the fact that metals are very reflective is also connected to uh, to these properties okay Finally, property six uh, is relates to another uh, beautiful result. Uh, and here it turns out, uh, with our, I think, uh, maybe like property one also, uh, where, where the result for the free electron gas is exact and also true for the interacting electron gas. They have the same property. And that's the limit where you send omega to infinity. So the omega to infinity means uh, very short time. So you're looking at the short time response. You have a very high frequency beam coming in, say X-ray or something in an electron gas with a frequency much higher than the Fermi energy. Uh, and, and this X-ray just oscillates the electron so fast uh, that it has no time to even see where its neighbors are. Uh, and that's why it's just uh, the result is kind of universal. It doesn't depend upon the electron interaction. Uh, and it leads to, as we'll talk about something uh, again in the next week or two, something you may have seen in uh, atomic physics, something called the F sum rule. So there is a F sum rule is a, an important property satisfied by atomic spectra. You get various spectral lines as a function of frequency. And there's a sum rule on the integral over the uh, over all of the absorption spectrum. That is, there's only a certain amount of uh, energy that the system can absorb over all energies. Uh, and there's a similar F sum rule here for the interacting electron gas. Uh, and it's very much related to this limit, although why it is, we don't know yet. But let's just compute this limit for now, because this will also be true or useful later on. So we take the Lindhardt expression uh, and send omega to infinity. So that's really very easy. You just expand the omega down here. So the first term is just one over omega with the same numerator. Uh, and now this is e to c, you see this is zero because uh, this integral is the same as that integral. It's just the integral over the Fermi sphere. It doesn't matter what coordinates you use. It just gives you the volume of the Fermi sphere. In fact, this is true at any temperature. So this is zero. Uh, in fact, this result, I don't even need to assume zero temperature. Uh, so you go to next order, you expand this to one more order. You get a one over omega squared and then you get some factors of these two coming in, so which is this over here. Uh, and now again, you have this expression here, you change variables of integration. So the first term, N, or NF of EQ times this, uh, then F of QQ times that, you keep. Uh, and then this term, uh, you, relate, you relabel Q plus Q as Q again, okay? So you do some relabeling. This will also change the relabeling here. Uh, and then everything only has an NF of EQ out front, and you'll get an EQ minus E of Q minus K. Okay, easy to see. And now this expression, it looks like it's dependent on Q, but in fact it isn't. You just expand this out. This is for, again, for K squared over 2M dispersion. You just expand it out, and it's just K squared over M. So just a constant independent of Q. Uh, now you can do the sum over Q. That just gives me the total density of particles, uh, that's N, is a K squared over M that comes from this expression. So that's the K squared over M, the one over omega squared comes from here, and therefore you have the result. So this is the basic result that a very high frequency, the free electron gas uh, has this high frequency limit where the coefficient here is just given by the total density of electrons. All right. Okay, oops, sorry. Okay, so curious result for now, but again, will be very useful to us uh, in thinking about the optical response of an interacting electron gas to electromagnetic radiation uh, and the appearance of what are called plasmons. So all of that will, will come in soon enough. All right, so that's all I have to say about the free electron gas. Uh, that's quite a lot. Uh, basically, and really, 
all I've computed is what's called the density density correlation function at arbitrary momentum and frequency. And just to summarize, there were six properties. Property one is that there's no response to spatially uniform perturbations because of conservation of number. Uh, the response to a slowly varying static per 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 uh, perturbation is the compressibility or the density of states. Uh, the response to not slowly varying static perturbation has something singular at 2kf. Uh, the finite frequency response uh, is dissipative, but there's dissipation only in certain regions of q omega space, the so-called particle hole continuum. And finally, uh, there's a sum rule. Uh, it's not sum rule, that, that the high frequency response is basically a free particle property, uh, nk squared over m omega squared, where m is the free particle mass. Um, and this will be very useful to us in sum rules and plasmons and so on. I should say this particular result is very specific to the k squared over 2m result. If you take some other dispersion, like a tight binding model in a solid, uh, the right-hand side is different. Uh, you don't just get the density, you get the kinetic energy and various other operators, but there's still a, some kind of one over omega squared decay. All right, any questions? All right, so now that you're all uh, complete masters of the free electron gas, uh, let's go to the interacting electron gas. Okay. So this is a really fundamental problem. Uh, you know, how does any metal or semiconductor or insulator, any material, which we are approximating by an electron gas here, respond to electromagnetic radiation? I mean, it's really the foundation of, of quantum physics, really. Uh, not done for atom, but done for a solid. Uh, so, and uh, but it's too hard a problem to solve exactly. No one can solve it, but we, you know, of course, today we understand it quite well. Uh, but before we get into exact results, uh, sorry, approximate results, let's say something exact. Just something that just defines the problem that we're looking at, uh, and relates to some very important quantities you you've met before. Uh, in studying electrodynamics of materials. So, so the, we have two terms in the Hamiltonian. There's the kinetic energy with some dispersion EK, uh, and then the Coulomb interaction, which I've written this way. Okay, so this is our electronic system of with interactions. So now we're going to apply some external potential phi x, uh, which will couple to the number density of the electrons. I should say what I, the convention I'm going to follow here, which I've already followed, uh, is that all factors of the electric charge uh, will be absorbed into the definition of the potential. Um, so, so that way, when I say rho of x, I don't mean charge density, I mean number density. It just makes life a little easier in keeping track of not having too many minus e's floating around. Okay. So that's why phi x is coupling to the number density, uh, not to the charge density, because I've only absorbed the factor of E into phi x. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we're doing an experiment. We are putting in some electrostatic potential uh, coupled to the number density. You could also put in a vector potential coupling to the current. Uh, that's discussed in the book. It's very parallel. Uh, we're just going to focus on the charge mostly in this course, but you can do the same sort of manipulation for uh, uh, for the vector potential too. Okay, so so this phi x is created, you know, by something in your lab. Uh, just for convenience, let's imagine that the phi x is created by some charges. So we have a bunch of charges. It could be charges in some external wire that we bring in next to our sample, uh, could be a backgate voltage, could be anything. So there's some charge density in our, in, in our universe, rho x of x and t. Uh, and rho x, this charge density in our universe, is something we are able to control for ourselves. So we just, uh, we just pick some 
by building a sufficiently clever apparatus, I have some rho x of x and t that I can control. All right. So let's just assume this phi x appears because of the presence of the rho x. So then, you know, phi x must be related to rho x by the Poisson's equation, uh, which is del squared phi is minus four pi rho. Uh, you take a Fourier transform and you put in suitable factors of e squares everywhere. And so then your phi x is related to rho x uh, by four pi e squared over q squared. The q squared comes from the Laplacian squared and Poisson's equation. The four pi is already in Poisson's equation. And the e squared is because of my strange convention of calling this number density rather than charge density. Okay. All right, so this is just the definition so far of phi x. So you're giving me a rho x, using rho x, I define a phi x. All right, now what Kubo formula tells us is that the presence of this external potential uh, is going to change my electron gas. It's going to produce some net charge density. In my electron gas, of course, there's a positive neutralizing background. So the charge density, total charge density is zero. Now I bring in some external potential, the neutralizing background I assume doesn't move. Uh, and then these electrons move around in response to uh, the external potential. And the mean charge density, I'm now going to call the induced charge density. So in here, uh, by definition, uh, this is equal to the change in charge density of the electrons uh, of Q and omega, well, of Q really, because it's an operator, and take its expectation value in the presence of this full Hamiltonian with the external potential. Of course, if I didn't have the external potential, rho induced would be zero. Okay, so real rho induced, uh, what's going on? Sorry, I'm sorry, my, uh, my iPad seems to have disconnected. Oh, oh, there it's back. Uh, must be an issue with the internet in my room. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, okay. So row induced uh, is produced by phi x. All right. But chi is the exact response function uh, of the interacting electron gas. So, of course, the, all of the difficulty and the reason for this course is how do you compute chi? <laughs> uh, and we don't know, but let's assume we knew what chi was. So that's the exact density-density uh, correlator of the interacting electron gas. Okay, so now I put these formulae together. And I compute what's called the total electro total charge density, rho total, where rho total includes not just the induced density, but the external charges that you brought in uh, to create the phi. So you brought in some external charges. Here's my sample sitting here. You bring in some external charges next to it. And my sample responds. Uh, and then I ask, well, what is the total charge density? Well, the total charge density is rho x plus rho induced. Uh, and so that's given by one plus four pi e squared chi squared over chi times rho x because uh, phi x is related to rho by this four pi e squared over q squared. You put it all together uh, and this is the result that you get, this quantity multiplied with external potential. And now you see what I've done here is exactly what you do with, uh, in your freshman electrodynamics course. Uh, you bring in a test charge into a material, uh, and then you say that charge, because of screening from the environment, gets reduced by the dielectric constant. So therefore, this, and that's exactly what I'm computing here. So rho total is related to the external charge, the physical charge that you bring in, divided by the dielectric constant. So, so I'm going to now equate this prefactor here with the dielectric constant. So that's the definition really of the dielectric constant. And unlike the dielectric constant that you meet in uh, freshman physics, it's also a function of momentum and frequency. It's a function actually, it's not just a constant, it's a whole function. Of course, the constant that you learn about uh, is the limit of this uh, epsilon as Q goes to zero 
and omega is the frequency of your radiation. So if you have microwave radiation, then you put omega equals your microwave. If you have light, you put omega equals to light, uh, and that you could, that's what you call the dielectric constant. All right, so we have a function, the dielectric function, and this dielectric function is directly related to the Kubo formula. So the Kubo, Kubo tells us the density density correlation function of the free electron gas in the absence of any external perturbation. That's what we have to compute. And this simple argument tells us what I'm actually computing is one over the dielectric constant with this correction. All right, so this is a very basic, one of the reasons for the importance of the Kubo formula it gives you a, a very simple and elegant expression for the dielectric constant that you would measure in the lab and, and this density density response function Q, chi of Q and omega. So really, you know, as a theorist, I just have to compute chi and give it to my experimentalist friends and they will go and measure epsilon by their own electrodynamic tricks in the, in the lab. And I don't, as a theorist, I don't need to know what the external charges look like uh, at all. And all I do is just compute this, which is just a property of the electron gas. Okay, so now we have to compute this. So now we finally have to bite the bullet uh, and compute chi. So what uh, I computed so far was the chi of the free electron gas. And you'd be very tempted to just replace this chi by chi zero. You know, why not? We, you know, we, uh, I have to, we assume the interactions are weak or they're screened or something. We've heard all these things that, uh, that uh, in a solid or an electron gas, the electrons are almost free uh, because of Pauli exclusion principle and screening. These are things you've probably heard about somewhere if you've not learned them. Uh, and we're going to learn, of course, these things more carefully. Uh, but the first point to remember here uh, is that that would be a terrible approximation. It turns out that's terrible. It will give you absolutely nonsensical results for the properties of, a, of an actual metal. If you just replace this chi by chi naught. And, and the reason it's terrible it really has to do, it's kind of staring at you in the face and has to do with the long range interaction of the Coulomb gas is one over Q squared out front. So even if this, you know, this, as Q goes to zero, this thing blows up. So I better be very careful. I understand the origin of singularity and see how it affects chi. Uh, so, and, okay. And this is very much, yeah, okay. So this is very much connected to the fact that uh, what I have here, what I'm accounting for here, roughly speaking, if you think of epsilon, the dielectric constant as, uh, something affecting screening. What I'm describing here is the screening of external charges by the electron gas. So you bring in some external charges and the electron gas will respond to it. Okay. However, what I have not accounted for, which I'm now going to account for, is the fact that the electrons inside the gas also screen each other. So if one electron moves, the other one, uh, will not feel it because a third one will screen that one. So I have to account for the fact that not only the external potential screen, but the internal charge density screen, electrons screen each other. And that's the physics that's missing. Okay, that sounds complicated, uh, but it turns out to be quite simple to account for that because it's such a strong effect. Uh, the fact that the electrons screen not only the external electrons, but also each other. All right, so that's, so now we are at the heart of, uh, you know, the first non-trivial calculation really in this course where we're going to do, uh, get some very interesting results uh, in a very simple approximation. Um, and this approximation really, you know, physics, there's only a few tricks. Uh, this is a trick, which really, again, goes back uh, to the van der Waals theory of the, of the dilute classical gas kind of a mean field like approximation, uh, which then became the Curie-Weiss theory of the, of the transition, and it became the Hartree-Fock theory uh, for the ground state of an electron gas. And now we're gonna do what's sometimes called the time-dependent Hartree-Fock theory or the random phase approximation, the same basic idea, 
but now applied not in a spatially uniform and time independent way, but for time dependent perturbations. Uh, okay, it's the same trick really, uh, but here it's absolutely essential uh, to get even an approximate you know, result. Without it, you get nonsense. All right, so we're going to do the time dependent hot tree, or more commonly in this field, it's called the RPA approximation. The words RPA you see all over in many papers. Uh, again, the reason for calling it RPA are very obscure and lost in very old papers. Uh, so I have no idea why it's called RPA. It's some kind of, in somebody's approximation at some point, they thought it could justify it by assuming the electrons at random phases or something like that. Anyway, that's what. It has other words too, like coherent potential approximation, or uh, well, mean field theory, whatever. So we'll call it RPA because that's what the books call it. Okay, so what is the RPA? So now I'm gonna do something exact, uh, sorry, approximate, not exact. All right, so this is our Hamiltonian that we're interested in. There's the kinetic energy, there's the Coulomb interaction, uh, and then there's the coupling of the charge density to the external potential. Now I've written just for convenience, the Coulomb interaction in this short form. I have, it's really C dagger, C dagger, C, C. Uh, and uh, when you normal order it, I have forgotten about the normal order because, well, I don't care about constants and I just want to make the notation a little compact. Uh, but if you really insist, uh, I can put the normal order in there by these fancy symbols uh, those fancy symbols just tell you that the C daggers appear before the C. All right, so what are we going to do? So now when it, the idea is just basically the same as the Hartree idea, uh, but it's at a much weaker footing. You know, the Hartree idea uh, was for the ground state or thermal equilibrium state uh, and was justified by a variational uh, wave function. Uh, and that gave us you know, some comfort that what we were doing was reasonable. Here we're not, it's actually not justified by any such thing. There are various hand-waving justifications, uh, but we're just gonna do it and see how it comes out and we get very sensible results. And then later on, we'll think about uh, what are the corrections to it, which turn out to be very weak generally. All right, so this is a basic approximation, not really uh, in, in the best, uh, you know, not really fully justified, but anyway, let's just do the do it. So here we have the Coulomb interaction, rho times rho, uh, and what we're going to do is uh, even something very mundane. I'm even going to ignore the exchange terms. So I'm just going to ignore uh, the Fock part of Hartree-Fock theory and only do the Hartree theory. You can put the Fock part in, but it just makes life more complicated. So initially let's keep life simple. So I'm going to replace this by the usual trick. First, I'll replace this by expectation value. Now in the Hartree-Fock theory, everything is time independent. Uh, and so this thing is some, uh, some number, but now I'm going to replace it by the average of this, but then you can ask the average at what time, because, uh, you know, time, uh, you have some external potential, which is also varying in time. So the key T idea is to replace it by the instantaneous value. So if you now imagine that the Hamiltonian, hard to fog Hamiltonian is going to become a function of time because you're perturbing it by an external potential as a function of time. Uh, and so I, I'm just going to replace this one of the rows by the average value at the same time. So now it has a dependence on time. Here, this is an operator which has no time evolution anyway uh, in the Schrodinger picture. Uh, but now this is the expectation value which will have some time dependence. And then I do the other one uh, that gives me this, uh, but there's a factor of one half there. Well, those two terms are obviously the same uh, after Q goes to minus Q. And so now I finally get a very simple Hamiltonian called HRPA, which has the usual kinetic energy and then my charge density of my electrons, which is a quadratic operator, just a C dagger C, coupled to some total potential, phi total. What is phi total? Well, it's the external potential that you applied plus the induced 
charge density times four pi e squared over q squared. Okay, so this is this is the key point. Uh, when I first started out, you know, if I am an electron sitting here, I only see the external potential. But now in this after this approximation, uh, the same electron here is seeing a very different potential. And that potential is not just due to the external potential, it's also due to the induced charge density. Okay, so that's the key, key idea that as far as any electron is concerned, all of the potentials are, uh, are external. So one electron here, it sees everything, it sees the total potential. Some of it is created by the external charges and the other is created by the induced charges, which, uh, which we don't know what rho induced are, so we just call it rho induced. But the point is that, and now you'll have the self-consistency that the induced charges uh, that are created now this, um, you know, so this electron seen some induced charges, well, those induced charges must be the density at that electron itself because all charges are the same. All right, so that's the key point, but I'll come back to it again. It sounds circular. And it is kind of circular. Every mean field theory is kind of circular. You assume a certain induced charge and you compute uh, the induced charge and make sure everything is the same, just like we did in Hartree-Fock theory also. So that's uh, the only difference here is that everything has a time dependence. So my phi total is the external potential time plus the induced charge density. And now when I do the response function of this new theory, now I can treat finally the electron as free electron. I can use the response function of the free electron gas. So that's the key step. Uh, the induced charge density, which is the exact response function times the external potential is approximated by the free electron response function acting on not the external potential, but the total potential. So the whole thing is, you know, how we went from external to total and total is related to external by this equation. And so now you notice that uh, induced appears on the RHS inside phi total. It also appears on the left as a response function. So the response depends upon the response and there's a self-consistent loop that you solve and that's the RPA. All right, so stop there and we'll certainly say more about this. You know, when you just solve these two equations and basically you know, now you have a, the RPA result, which has a huge amount of physics. I mean, some large fraction of condensed matter physics is just basically described by that formula in, in various contexts. <laughs> And not just condensed matter, you could also apply it to atomic physics and other fields. <laughs> chemistry, huge amount of chemistry is basically done by formula like this. Okay, so any questions? Yes, I, I have a... Oh. Yeah, Martin. I, I have a quick question. Uh, so there where we do this um, Hartree like approximation, um, mm -hmm. So we we just write that the average of the density is this rho induced. But my understanding was that this like rho induced was average of the like different like variation of 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 rho, like delta rho, right? At least that's what we used before. Right. So, but uh, uh, the before there was any external potential, the rho was canceled by the positive, uh, uniform positive background. So, so delta rho is just zero when you don't have, uh, uh, you don't have an external potential. So I, I you know, there's, there's more, another, word, another way to say it, there are, if you go back to the original discussion, there are many more terms in a Hamiltonian. There's also, a, a positively charged background, which is then interacting with the electron. There's all these other terms having to do with that. If you account for all of that, um, then basically the, the net result is that delta rho, uh, where did I go? Yeah, so this delta rho is just zero when you, delta rho is proportional to phi x. because of the cancellation from the positive background. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, or, or if, if you're dealing with a neutral gas, uh, 
like helium, then then uh, then you just define rho induced as the difference between rho and rho naught. It's just that for electron gas, you don't have to worry about that detail. I was curious if there's any connection between um, the response function for the free electron gas and like a Druda line shape um, that we uh, expect for the classical model. Yes, um, you know that uh, involves uh, the current current correlation function, not the charge charge correlation function, but the two are related by uh, equation of motion. Uh, but also to get the Druda line shape, you have to have scattering. So you have to have impurities or something uh, which lead to momentum non-conservation of the current. Mm. Uh, and that's not included in the formula we have discussed so far. Okay. So really the, uh, so this, if, I, if I'm thinking of computing dissipation of electromagnetic radiation from, uh, and, uh, from this formula so far, well, it's approximately valid at higher frequencies. When you you know you have the Druda line shape at low frequencies, uh, that has to do with the, roughly the center of mass motion of the electron gas. Uh, but then you go to higher frequencies, there are absorption which are some continua, uh, and we're really talking about those higher frequencies. So those higher frequency absorptions, not the DC to the part, uh, is what's given by the particle hole continuum. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? All right, great. So uh, I'll be available, I promise, for discussions at uh, 9 p.m. today. And uh, yeah, I think you'll find that the course is now certainly going to get uh, quite a bit more subtle and we're going to talk about uh, some lots of new phys lots of physics emerging from fairly simple computations. Okay. Okay, see you tonight or Monday.